Now for the bigger picture, we have a very important guest with us, Nick Parsons, the head of research and strategy at Thomas Lloyd, joins us now in the studio. Nick, Actually, we've spoken to you for so long, long distance mm -hmm. uh, from Mumbai to London. Mm. It's a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you and good morning. All right. Well, for starters, the big talking point mm -hmm. is the skirmish on the border. Mm -hmm. uh, how do foreign investors view that? Is it just a passing irritant? Uh, in India itself, some people believe that this has improved the chances of the NDA returning to power. Well, it was fascinating to read the press in London and elsewhere over the weekend uh, before I came out. Uh, and really the view from diplomats and government officials in London and across the European Union uh, was really a call for calm uh, and a belief that this could uh, actually be diffused with goodwill on both sides. And it did appear at least uh, that that was happening uh, when we got into Saturday night and then into mm -hmm. Sunday. Uh, and there is no sense whatsoever uh, mm -hmm. of panic or alarm uh, in Europe at the moment. It, it really hasn't been something that's been on the investors' radar no, no, screen. But, no, but as an India investor, mm -hmm. uh, are you also reading it as uh, likely strengthening the hands of the present government? That is, I think, a, a reasonable conclusion. Uh, of course, it remains to be seen uh, how it will play out over the next couple of weeks uh, because, as in all political events, there's plenty of scope for the unexpected. Yeah. Uh, and though the instant and knee-jerk reaction is to see that this will strengthen the hand of the incumbent, mm -hmm. there's always scope for things to go horribly wrong in this because although this seems to be straight out of any a global pre-election playbook. Mm. If it were really that simple, it's a bit like a sports <laughs> event. If it were that simple, yeah. we wouldn't need to play the game if we could if we could uh, forecast it all in That's advance. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> Nick. Uh, mm. It's a pleasure having mm. you here with mm. us in our studio. Mm. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us. Uh, because of the reasons you stated, the uncertainty with respect to the mm. political events, will Indian markets trade at a discount to other emerging market pairs? And how would you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, plan your investments mm. for the year? Well, I think Indian investments are already trading at somewhat of a discount. If we look at the performance since the 1st of January this year, India has been a laggard. And let's compare that with the performance in 18, where India was the best of all the emerging markets, in fact, one of the very best returning markets globally. So India kind of had its day okay. uh, for, for, for global investors. There has been uh, a, a sense of caution uh, entering those markets. And here we are with the Nifty and the Sensex within touching distance of where they were on the 2nd of January. Yeah. So as the rest of the market has had the volatility, as the rest of the emerging markets universe has generally tended to advance, India's been somewhat left behind in that. Uh, and I think that perhaps explains its resilience and somehow a sense of calm over the last few trading sessions okay. because it hasn't had those speculative inflows, mm -hmm. it hasn't had the hot money driving the indices higher and therefore it's less vulnerable uh, to a sell-off in these mm -hmm. times of nervousness. Okay. <coughs> Nick, hi, good morning. Thanks hi. a lot for joining us good in our work. studios. Uh, uh, you know, hope you have a good trip. Mm -hmm. uh, you, do you think uh, in that case we could be preparing ourselves for a big second half rally once the election uncertainty is also out of the way uh, and perhaps, you know, the foreign funds start to resume as well? And the domestic liquidity has been quite strong in India, mm -hmm. so that's always mm -hmm. been the support factor. So do you think second half outperformance is possible? Well, I think that, of course, is contingent on the political outturn. Uh, but if we were to take as a base case mm -hmm. that we we're going to get a re-election of the current administration, then I think a second half outperformance would be a reasonable expectation. I think also it's reasonable to expect that the EM universe as a whole mm -hmm. is probably going to outperform its developed market counterparts. Uh, and so if we're going to get some positive momentum in terms of relative performance, then we start to look at sectoral breakdowns, we start to look at individual company uh, macro drivers, and then I think we can start to make uh, a much better case, much better investment case for India in the second half of the year than we perhaps can in the first. And I'm somewhat encouraged by its resilience over this first yes. seven, eight, nine weeks. But of course, that resilience is merely the flip side of a lack of investor participation. So it kind of cuts both ways at okay. the moment. Uh, uh, Nick, you know, one thing that clearly affects India the most mm -hmm. 
uh, not the only one, but certainly mm. the most is uh, crude prices. Yes. And uh, last year, Indian outperformance was largely because we saw crude fall from a high of $86 mm. to about $60. Mm -hmm. I know it's a mugs game, but how do you call crude this year? Well, we've been calling it either side of $60 uh, on average for the, uh, for the whole of 19. And I still think that seems a reasonable expectation. The demand side, it would appear, is going to fall somewhat shy of consensus estimates because we've got a, a, a global economy that the risks seem tilted to the downside. The supply of energy, on the other hand, uh, is actually increasing, not just in oil prices, but the competi competition for oil. We've got renewable energy, we've got solar, we've got wind, we've got yeah, others. And so we've got a change in the energy mix, yes. which is also helping to cap crude prices. And that is something which ought to be offering some support to India more generally. As you say, yeah. it's not just about the current account, but it's about inflation uh, and it's about yes. real income growth and all those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. unless we were to see a return to the highs of last year, and I think that looks unlikely, uh, then I don't think oil is going to be the concern that it was for EM and for India in the early part of 2018. Since you are here mm. in India, mm. uh, have you had any interactions with any companies, any investors? Are things better now than they were? Ex of, of course, all mm. the political skirmishes. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the feeling with regard to Indian investments? Well, we're, we're investors in real assets. Mm. So we, we don't invest in stocks and shares. Oh. Uh, we invest in real assets. We create real assets in the renewables and infrastructure sector. Mm. Uh, and, and those have got a long lead time. Uh, they've got an even longer payback time. Yes. And given the energy mix that we see in India and given... Uh, the clear support that's given to that sector through very clearly outlined government policies, then I don't think the investors that we're speaking to, uh, either here in India or those with whom we partner in Europe and elsewhere, are in the slightest bit phased by this. So the, the outlook for real investment in the infrastructure sector and the energy sector is as strong as it ever has been, okay. and the investment case is, is actually overwhelming. Okay. All right. A final question mm. to you then. Uh, you know, there is a case that some economists make that India has gotten too fiscally loose mm -hmm. and the monetary policy is following in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the previous governor, of course, the current governor mm -hmm. has been way more dovish, mm -hmm. uh, his last statement. And of course, the uh, fiscal deficit, though the number says 3.37, mm -hmm. uh, the revenues are overestimated and the expenditure is underestimated. Mm -hmm. So the expectations of a 4% fiscal deficit, uh, it's explained by the fact that bond yields have not fallen mm -hmm. uh, in spite of the rate cut. Is that a worry, those macros that uh, things have gotten <coughs> more loose than investors may like? I think the concern is that the RBI is, if you like, banking all the gains before they've been realised. Okay. And I thought the, the, the rate cut a few weeks ago was somewhat hasty. Now, for the moment, they've got away with that because, of course, anything that's seen to be helping electoral prospects, and a rate cut never does any harm, does it, anywhere yeah. in the world. Anything that's seen to help the politics mm. is somehow excused. Okay. Um, but I think it's a dangerous game. And if we look elsewhere through the EM universe and indeed through the Asia region, other central banks, I'm thinking here of the Philippines, I'm thinking of Indonesia, um, they've also faced... Uh, the possibility mm. of cuts, and they've chosen not to do it. Okay. And there's a sense in which the RBI has, has perhaps been somewhat too keen okay. uh, to cut, and that's going to be something we'll have to keep our eyes on, because that was... it was excused, but I think it, were that to continue, then it would possibly uh, begin to uh, threaten some of the stability that we've seen of late in the FX market and we've seen in the rupee. OK. Nick Parsons, it's always a pleasure Thank having you. you with us. Thank you so much for dropping into our studios. Hope you have a very good trip in India and uh, we'll, of course, continue our long-distance chat. I look forward to it and thank you all for your very kind welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, with that, we have to go into our first break. We are going to come back with the entire research team and detail to you the top ten list of stocks that we are watching.